is the Gulf of Mexico, just off the coast of Louisiana. It's somewhere I have always wanted to visit, but I never ever wanted to see it like this. All around me are great big lumps of crude oil floating in this sea. And as far as the eye can see, lots of boats have been recruited to help and contain this horrific disaster. Much of the oil came ashore on the islands of the Mississippi River Delta, one of the most important wetland ecosystems in the whole of North America. The Gulf of Mexico is home to a countless number of species, from the smallest microorganisms like plankton to the largest marine mammals like the resident sperm whales that come here. And once the smallest microorganisms take in the toxic oil, the entire food chain, all the way up to the top predators, gets affected. And of course, this is incredibly important marshland in which there are unicellular organisms called microalgae, and they're very, very crucial to this ecosystem. They do things like taking in the carbon dioxide and releasing oxygen. Once they are poisoned by the oil, the whole food chain is in trouble. Now, just how oil disasters affect ecosystems and their wildlife depends not only on how much oil is out there, but also what kind of oil it is. Now, in some cases of oil spills, you're talking about refined oil. It's already been turned into diesel or petrol, and it looks like this, and it's incredibly toxic. So the main effect to wildlife is going to be poisoning. But as with the case of this disaster, you're talking about crude oil, stuff that looks like this. It's thick and gloopy and sticky. Unlike refined oil, which despite its toxicity evaporates and breaks down quite quickly, crude oil like this will stick around for years. We've got these sorbent booms, the white ones that are now completely soiled with the oil on the inside, and then these containment booms that are also covered of oil as well. Now these are designed to protect the really important nesting grounds. For many plants, fish and microorganisms, there really is very little we can do once they're affected. But we can treat some larger species, like birds. Even then, you have to realize that they're only a tiny part of the ecosystem that's under threat. And the success rate is far from certain. A key species is the brown pelican, the emblem of the state of Louisiana. It's only just been taken off the USA's list of endangered species, which is why a massive effort is being made to airlift them from all over the Gulf for treatment at the Fort Jackson Bird Rehabilitation Center. Wow. I didn't actually realize there would be so many pelicans in here. If a bird makes it this far, it's likely it will be suffering from the effects of oil ingestion, hypothermia, and malnutrition. Only when they've got their strength back can the process of cleaning begin. So the thing with pelicans, which is great, is that they have a, a natural inbuilt handle. So we actually hold the bill and we keep the bill open because they only have very small nostrils, so they breathe through their mouth a lot. So you've got to clean inside the mouth as well because there's loads of oil in there from the preening process, right? Yes, yeah, so the pelicans often are getting oiled when they dive into the water to scoop fish up with their pouches. It really is so horrific to see all of these birds under these conditions. They're covered in crude oil, and that oil has completely destroyed the feathers' ability to function. And feathers have hugely important functions in birds. These are the vein feathers, or the outer feathers of birds, and they're made up of a central shaft running down the middle, and then loads of side branches called barbs on each side. Now, every single barb has lots of barbules, and those barbules have lots of minuscule hooklets that all provide cross-attachment like this, and it all results in this beautiful waterproof barrier. Let me show you if I pour some water on top of it. Look at that. It just runs off. Now, the oil isn't running off like the water did. And as the bird is trying to preen the oil off, the feathers begin to get really matted, and all of the barbules are separated. They're not interlinked anymore. And basically, the feathers collapse. So you lose your waterproofing. You lose your insulation and you lose your buoyancy. And that's why all of these birds are in so much trouble.
Even the smallest trace of oil left on the bird will cause problems as the preening action will simply spread it around again. So every single bit must be removed. You see she's using a spray gun and that's actually just making sure that we get the detergent uh, in under those outer feathers and into the, the soft downy feathers. Okay. And then after that, there's a series of sinks that they, that they bathe in. And what we do in those sinks is we aggravate the water. So we're not scrubbing the bird, but we're aggravating the water around the feathers. It breaks my heart to see them like this. I know you're doing incredible work and you're helping to save these birds, but just to see them in this stressful condition is really hard to watch. It always affects you. But I think just the way, the same way that people who work in a hospital or, or fight fires, that, are, that we're trained to do a particular task and we have to stay focused enough on that task. And one of the things that, about the rinse that you, you see when you're rinsing the bird is because the feathers naturally repel water, there's a point where you begin to rinse where you actually start to see water beading off the feathers. Good and that's news. the time when you know that you're nearly there. This team has washed uh, over 250 pelicans in the last eight days. So wow, at this point, wow, it's, it's really a production line. I'm so impressed with these guys. They're just getting on with the job, even though, especially this pelican, is so feisty and really putting up a good fight. I just got soaked. <laughs> Which is good. It means he's strong, and it means he's certainly ready to get out to the pools outside. Once the bird is clean, it's taken to a drying pen. As the feathers dry, the bird starts to preen naturally, gradually realigning its feathers back into the neat pattern that creates that waterproof seal. Oh, look at them, they're all clean again. It's so cool to see them like that. To get a bird to this stage has taken the team at least five days, and only 80% have survived the ordeal. But in a few hours, these birds will be flown to Texas for their release, hundreds of miles away from the oil. I have to say, this is just the most amazing sight I've had all day. My heart sank when I saw the oil birds in there getting treated, but this is the result of all the hard work, and it's absolutely awesome. It's just an appalling situation. Isn't it? it really is. I'll tell you what, it only just properly sank in when I was on the plane on the way home because when you're on the ground, everything you're seeing is just so surreal and overwhelming. I mean, for me, this is an engineering catastrophe mm. that's, that's had shocking environmental consequences. And what I wanted to know was how do disasters like this occur in the first place and what can we do to then bring them under control once the worst has happened? It doesn't matter where you drill for oil you always hit the same basic problem. Most oil reservoirs are under a vast amount of pressure. So, as you drill down through thousands of feet of rock, you end up with a situation like me drilling into this modified car tire. The oil quite literally erupts from the hole, gushing out of control from the well. But if drilling into an oil reservoir is this hazardous, what on earth do they do to bring it under control? Answer, they use mud, and lots of it. This is probably the most important substance in the oil industry. But to show you how it works, I'm going to need to build an oil well. What we've got here is an oil rig, and it's positioned above over a 1,000 metres of seawater, then a couple of miles of rock, down to an enormous oil reservoir. Now, that reservoir is under huge pressure, and if I were to be reckless enough to go drilling willy-nilly into that oil reservoir, we're pretty much guaranteed a disaster. So what do I do? I use this. Mud. It's mainly a clay called bentonite mixed with water. This lot has a specific gravity of 1.75, which means it's nearly twice as dense as oil. Okay, that's the drill hole full of mud. And if I've got my sums right, when I burst through into our oil reservoir, the weight of mud in this pipe should exactly balance the force of the oil trying to squirt up. And... We're definitely through there, I can feel it, but it's balancing. There is no oil coming up, yet the pressure of the oil should be sufficient to squirt it straight out of the top. It's totally being held 
just by the weight of the mud in the tube. This simple system is what keeps thousands and thousands of oil wells around the world from blowing out. But for whatever reason, this hydrostatic balance, as it's called, was lost on board Deepwater Horizon. Oil and methane burst out of the rig and exploded, killing 11 and causing the biggest oil spill in US history. So what do you do once an oil well like this goes out of control? First thing you try <coughs> is pumping heavy mud back in there. The idea is to increase the weight of the mud in the tube and fight the enormous pressure of the reservoir pushing oil up. BP tried that in May, it didn't work. The next thing to try is to cap the well. It's like putting a massive steel cork in the top of it. But it is like a massive steel cork and that's only a temporary measure. The one way to finish the well completely is to drill a relief well. And this is how it's done. A second well is drilled, the so-called relief well. But this one goes down and across through a few thousand metres of rock. Now, that is an astonishing engineering feat because you're not only drilling sideways, you're trying to hit something no bigger than a lamppost. And that's through. OK, now what happens is mud is forced down into there. And as it goes into the original well, the oil pushes it up until the original well is full of mud. Then the weight of that mud prevents any more oil escaping the reservoir. If they manage to achieve this in the Gulf of Mexico, they'll then replace the mud with concrete and kill the whole well off forever. I've spent most of my life working in engineering, and I still find it almost mind-boggling that they can even attempt these deep water wells. Yeah. We're talking about drilling a hole that's a mile below the ocean surface, and then through another two miles of solid rock before hitting a high-pressure oil reservoir. Yeah, I mean, it's unknown. So can we sensibly ask if it's going to happen again? For me, that's possibly the best thing that can come out of this, is that there is a leap forward in kind of drilling safety and drilling technology. But Ultimately, we're looking for oil in such technically difficult environments now that I don't think we can categorically say no. That's the key point, isn't it? Liz, let's just talk about some of the, the long-term environmental implications of all of this. Well, well, scientists simply can't put a figure on it. They can't predict when species would ever be able to recover fully from a disaster like this one. You know, this is unprecedented. I mean, the birds I saw were the tip of the iceberg. If you think about all the animals that live under the surface of the water, a lot of the dead animals are going to sink to the bottom, so you can't recover them and quantify the extent of the damage to the ecosystem. Atlantic bluefin tube are a good example of, of all of this because their populations only breed in two places in the entire world, the Med and the Gulf of Mexico, and they were spawning in April at the time this disaster happened. So chances are that population is going to be in big trouble. You know the Exxon Valdez disaster yeah. is now 21 years old, okay? There is still oil out there from that disaster, and in some places species like sea otters, killer whales still haven't recovered fully. So, I mean, how does this disaster compare with the Exxon Valdez spill? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, at its highest estimate, this disaster is an Exxon Valdez every four days. See, that's just scary, isn't it? No, it's just, really. uh, it's not good. Listen, we're going to have to stop there, otherwise we're going to be talking about this all day. We have to